Now, for more on the economies of Malaysia and Southeast Asia, I'm joined by Song Wonsoon, economics professor at California State University, Channel Islands. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you. Now, Malaysia's 2017 economic report and budget spanned several fields, including security, entrepreneurship, and even calling for more private investment and pro-business strategies. What do you think were the most important policies unveiled? Well, clearly, uh, economic growth, uh, including infrastructure, infrastructure investments and security, uh, those are some of the key issues. Uh, Unfortunately, because of a slow economic growth, uh, the revenues are not going up very rapidly. At the same time, the government is trying to uh, hold down budget deficits. So in these situations, it is uh, very difficult to allocate very large sums into a single area. But clearly, uh, the investments uh, is in infrastructure and bridges and et cetera, that is a very key objective. And this is one of the ways to accelerate economic growth uh, of uh, Malaysia. Now, overall growth is expected to be between 4 to 5 percent over the next year, thanks to a number of factors, including domestic consumption. Is that pace enough for Malaysia? No, I think it needs to grow at a faster pace uh, because it is a developing nation with a population growth. But at the same time, I'm not quite sure if the economic growth will approach 5 percent. I wouldn't be surprised if it uh, stays around 4 percent this year as well as uh, into 2017. Uh, Malaysia, as you know, is a very open economy. About 40 percent of its uh, economic growth is coming from uh, exports. And also, of that 40 percent of exports, uh, we are talking about a lot of uh, minerals, uh, commodities, uh, uh, and electronic and ele electric goods. So the fact that the world economy is very soft, the uh, Chinese economy is slowing down, and the price of oil is weak, uh, these are some of the reasons why uh, it would be very difficult for the Malaysian economy to grow very rapidly in 2017. If we can get something around 4 percent, I think uh, we would be doing pretty well. Now, you mentioned some of those traditional growth drivers like exports of goods and services. And according to the World Bank, some of those are close to stalling. So what about other drivers like the digital economy? How central could they be to expanding Malaysia's growth? Uh, clearly, that's uh, very important. Uh, like uh, many other countries, uh, Malaysia is trying to wean away from its uh, traditional sources of exports, such as uh, uh, oil and then uh, uh, other uh, commodities, uh, and trying to emphasize uh, high tech, uh, because uh, the country does export quite a bit of uh, electronic, electric goods. As a result, uh, it does have a lot of uh, skills and know-how. So I think you know this is a very good way to promote economic growth in the future. But uh, it takes time, so you cannot do it in a hurry. So I doubt that this will re really the, turn the economy around and show a, a very healthy economic growth in 2017 beyond what we expect. Now, the country is also looking towards a new generation of trade deals, but it's not alone when it comes to its, the, all these recent protests that we're seeing against the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP. So what are the biggest points of contention for protesters in Malaysia? Well, many people think that uh, it really doesn't help the average person uh, in the street. Uh, it is compromising, really, the uh, economic integrity of uh, Malaysia. And what it does is it uh, benefits uh, large multinational corporations. And many small to medium-sized businesses in uh, uh, Malaysia, they get hurt. And uh, they end up raising uh, prices, and the inflation rate goes up. So uh, clearly, there are some benefits, but also uh, there are some disagreements uh, regarding uh, the benefits of international trade. Uh, but having said that, Malaysia is an open economy, and uh, one of the best ways to grow uh, for the country is to emphasize international trade. If it slows or shut down international trade, uh, uh, it will hurt the economy badly. I hope it doesn't do that. Now, another thing Malaysia is trying to do is position itself as the world's, as the world's leading Islamic finance center. So what sort of developments have we seen on that front? Oh, it's been very uh, exciting. In fact, uh, Islamic banking has been uh, very successful for the last uh, four decades uh, plus. Uh, it has essentially a dual banking system. Uh, you know, you and I can go to a traditional bank and pay interest and borrow money, or you can go to an Islamic bank and then do banking slightly differently but accomplish the same results. And, uh, uh, you know, they, uh, they take care of uh, not only Muslims but non-Muslims as well. So uh, really the term Islamic banking uh, does not mean that it caters simply to people who, uh, you know, who are Muslims. And then so uh, it's been, you know, very helpful uh, in growing the uh, Malaysian economy and will continue to be do so. Now, the only difference is, let's say, you are buying a house in the United States uh, in uh, traditional banks. 
you get a loan and then pay interest rates. But right. the Islamic banks, uh, they can't do that. So they would uh, buy the house for you, and then they sell it to you, of course, at a profit. And then you make the payments to the bank over time. That's well, definitely something we'll be keeping an eye on. Thank you so much. We'll have to leave it there. Professor Song Monsoon from California State University, Channel Islands.